Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi guys, hope you're well. Sorry, I know we're having some real issues tonight. So, uh, is that better? Can you hear me now? Right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, bloody heck. Okay. So we've had a bit of we've had a massive issue there. So God knows I've had to literally log in, log out four times to try and get you. But we're gonna get through this. Okay. So. We're going to figure out what it's worth. We're going to sell the deal and make some money. And now we're going to get yourself to financial freedom. So I've talked a little bit about who I am and what I do. My name's Arshilahi. Lahi. I run a group of 12 companies with my brother Aki Lahi. And together we're landlords and letting agents. And we've now got over 500 tenants all on benefits with a 100% rent collection record and a very high 98% occupancy rate. So if you've never met me before, I'm on the left and Aki is on the right. So uh, I've written a book called Boom, Bust and Back Again. Uh, I'm a speaker, I'm an author, I'm a trainer, I'm a landlord, I'm a property investor and a franchise or a letting agency. So for those that have never heard of a magazine called YPM before, it's called uh, Your Property Network. It's written by property investors for property investors. So, um, And if you've never seen it or heard it, I, I would strongly recommend reading it because it's it's a great source of knowledge. And for the for the amount that it costs, there's a lot that you can learn from it. So I was we were going to try and get our friend, well, Neil McCoy Ward, um, giving you a bit of a background about who he is and what he does. He's a landlord, uh, but he's predominantly known for his rent to rent and deal sourcing strategies. Uh, and he's a keynote speaker as well as a serial entrepreneur. And the reason why I say that is because he's got multiple businesses over different spectrums of uh, industries. So, he's, and the one that he's most notorious for is a forward thinking group. He's a sales, is a corporate marketing and sales trainer, and he was the ex entrepreneur in residence for Coventry University of the Year 2015. So, uh, we were meant to have Neil on board, but he's actually in California at the moment. And because the internet has been so bad, we had him on on the first time that we we're there. We can't seem to connect into him now at present. So I'll keep trying to log him in throughout the evening. But the reason why we make this a point is because when you're when you've got your business systemized to a point, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You can do this from anywhere. Just so that I know, and I'm going to keep checking in with you guys. Can you still hear me? Can you see me clear? Well, can you see the slides clearly? Uh, because I want to make sure that I'm not literally just talking to myself. Okay, cool. So Neil's currently in California. I'll try and get him online as soon as we can. Now, uh, the one thing that I always do on all the webinars, I like to know who we've got online and the reason why we've got you online. Now, and more importantly, why do you want to get involved in property? Now, I've put up some of the most obvious answers that we consistently get, which is like they want to alleviate health issues, they want to resolve finance problems, and they want to escape the rat race. You want to be your own boss. If you wouldn't mind, would you mind telling me what what it is that you want to do and why you want to get involved in property? Okay, so someone's coming straight away and said most of the above, freedom, be your own boss, want to leave the rat race, own my own life. That's an interesting one, and I like that one. Uh, someone says that they want to sort out better cash flow. Um, okay. Right, so there's a lot, lot of things here. Okay, so a lot of people saying all of the above. Now, there's lots of webinars on the internet and you know with all due respect there's lots of people out there trying to shift courses and they're saying that this strategy and that strategy uh you know which which is the best way what's this what's the strategy some people still saying buy to let some people saying hmo some people saying this some people are saying that now my reason my question that i've got to ask now is why now why is now the perfect time to change the reason why I say that is because predominantly before this year, a lot of people have pretty much almost like been house banking or land banking property as their fail safe, as their pension pot. And it's been a pretty stable ride up until now. And the reason why I say that is purely because earlier this year, our friend George Osborne came out and he said, well, in actual fact now, 
George Osborne's agenda is very simple. He wants to get as many people into their own homes as possible. So the way that he's doing that is trying to make it as difficult as he can for landlords. So he's trying to charge them uh, an additional premium so that they don't purchase property, so that there's more property available to homeowners or to first-time buyers. What he doesn't understand is that these guys can't afford to buy it. So where are they going to live in the meanwhile? So this has kind of put landlords in a bit uh in a bit of a predicament what do they do do they continue to keep on buying and paying the additional three percent stamp duty which they've now got to incur per property even if it's below the stamp duty threshold um and more importantly how's that going to go on going forward now a lot of people talking about do they transfer com uh, properties into companies and that carries an additional cost when you start looking at it you've got to start to think well is it actually worth owning properties anymore now, people always talk about this thing called financial freedom. When we touched upon it pre for, uh, pre, uh, for a short while, and the one thing that I find is that when you own property, is that you don't actually own it until it's actually paid off. So as far as I'm concerned, you're always tied to somewhere like the bank or you're always tied to a bank manager who's consistently asking, you know, how's, how's it performing, what's it doing, etc., etc. Now, for argument's sake, I'm going to give an example here. Is that let's just say that you've got a property and it's a hundred thousand pounds. Now, unless you've got a hundred thousand pounds to buy outright, that means that the bank is always going to own the property until it's owned outright. So, let's just say for this example that you take a seventy-five percent mortgage. Now, on the seventy-five percent mortgage, on an average of around four percent of seventy-five grand, seventy-five percent, it would be approximately three hundred pounds a month. Now, if you're renting that property out for £500 a month, it doesn't give you a massive cash flow. It gives you about £200 a month, but then we haven't taken into consideration lots of other things like voids, bad debt, management, maintenance. So once you've calculated all that over a year, so at its best case scenario, provided it's fully occupied, it should produce 2400 a year. But once you start taking into other consideration and other bills and maintenance you're not going to get that it's highly unlikely that you're going to get that you've got to work on the basis that you've not got no maintenance fully occupied you're managing it yourself and it's working as perfect as it can be and you may have a couple of years like that but believe me every year something else will prop up and if a boiler goes that's just wiped out half your cash flow so a couple of things just to take into consideration there so buying property now well, when we say buying property is when we're acquiring property to hold for the long term, unless you're doing something strategic with it to generate additional cash flow, I don't think it's going to be a long-term sustainable um, strategy, especially as a standard single let, buy to let. And when I saw this quote, I thought this was quite powerful. We're not just we're not born just to pay bills and die, which is in essence, if you've got a buy to let and it's just ticking over. That's exactly what's going to happen. You're pretty much buying you're buying the property, you're babysitting it, and you're not actually making any money. And then you're hoping for the long term. You're hoping that it's going to benefit in capital growth in the long term. And we haven't even taken into consideration the people living in the property. How are they going to treat it? Now, for argument's sake, now going back to our example there of a hundred thousand pounds. If your cash flow is two thousand four hundred, let's just say that you haven't had, you know, in an ideal world, this would be the perfect tenant. They look clean, they clean, look happy, they look like they're unpacking, they bought everything in boxes, they're presentable, and they look like they can be great tenants. But what happens is that what happens in scenarios where we've got tenants like this, where they aren't the cleanest of people, they may have caused some damage to your property. What does that do to your cash flow? And let's just say that they've been in your property a year. And you've now got cash. You had a cash flow of two thousand four hundred for the year, but in actual fact, it's going to cost you three grand to put it right. How does that work? Because in a, in actual fact, it's actually costing you money to own property, and that's for me isn't a definition of financial freedom. Okay, it might be in the long term that might be a pension plan. You might be holding it for your kids, but you want to be looking at what cash can you generate in the meanwhile. So these are some of the other things that you may come across. Maintenance, voids, bad debt, damage, letting agents, tenants, evictions, government intervention, and so much more. 
So we're going to be talking about this strategy called deal sourcing because deal sourcing has become ever so popular and it's always been a popular uh, strategy purely because it costs, well, depending on where you are, you can pretty much go and start deal sourcing as of tomorrow, providing you know how. Uh, someone's just put that the audio is still quite erratic. Is everyone still hit? Am I okay or am I still on or off? Okay, so everyone's saying that it's okay so far. So if you do have issues, um, if you do have issues, you may have to log out and log back in uh, and go from there. Okay, so question I've got to ask, uh, you've got to ask is, can I really replace my income with property sourcing income? My answer is absolutely. And the reason why I say that is because others have done it, and you can too. We've created more success stories this year than on any other year on record, and we're only at the start of May. Now, here's something that I saw, and I've, I use this in quite a lot of my presentations, and I think it's because of a very powerful quote. The secret to success is to own nothing but to control everything. And that was written by a gentleman called Nelson Rockefeller. Um and when you look at some of the largest companies in the world today, it's like Facebook doesn't own any content. Airbnb doesn't own any accommodation. And finally, people like um, Uber taxis doesn't actually own Uber. It's pretty much a case of controlling everything now as opposed to owning everything. And that's why you know people like letting agents and rent to rent does really well. But today we're talking about deal sourcing. And I want to get you completely involved and completely showing you everything that we need to do with deal sourcing. So just so that I know that we've got everyone online, does has anyone done any deal sourcing? Has anyone done any deal sourcing uh, as of yet? Okay, so no, not yet, no. Okay, so we've got quite a few people that are interested in the strategy. Okay, great. And the reason why I say that, it's very simple, is because there's three parties involved in deal sourcing. There's the vendor, who is the homeowner. But, and then in the middle, there's you, which is the deal maker. And finally, there's the purchaser. Who is a person going to be buying the property? And all three parts, all three people have a really important part to play. And we'll go through this in great detail because the vendor is the person that owns the property. There's you who is the cog and the key to all of it because you've got to negotiate with the vendor. You've got to either get the discount or you've got to seal the deal with the vendor. And then you've got to make sure that it works financially to a point where you can sell it to the purchaser. And at any point, you won't be owning the property. It's pretty much A, B, C in strategy. A is a vendor, B is you, and C. You, A and B negotiate the deal, and then B and C sells the deal. C is the buyer, B is the controller. Now, uh, Johnny's, uh, Johnny Walker's just come online and says, can you also go through the risks involved? Now, the beauty of it is, with deal sourcing, your risk, your risk is so limited because, because you don't own it. There is no risk attached to it. If the deal doesn't stack up, you don't do the deal. If you can't sell the deal, you don't do the deal. All you've done is you've got yourself, you've bought your time, bought, bought yourself some time. You ha actually physically don't put any cash into the property transaction. That's why this strategy is so powerful. You're simply controlling the transaction. Now, um, for those that we've got online, have you ever been approached by a sourcer with a deal asking for free, for a fee? And if so, how much was that fee? And more importantly, how did it make you feel? The reason why I'm going to ask this question is, so has no one ever contacted you with a, a property and said, okay, the property, here's a property, here's a location, 
it's worth this, you can buy it for this, and we want a fee associated with it. So some people have come in and said, okay, some people said £1,500, some people said three grand, um, and Sarah's come in straight away and said, yes, and I bought it and I paid £3,000. Um, some people are saying three to 5000 Okay, and then Anne has said no, but she's seen it on uh, Facebook. Okay, there's lots of deals all over the country. So the reason why I say, how did it make you feel? Because when you're looking at that, you, some people think, well, how can he justify charging three grand for a deal that he doesn't own? But you've got to remember, going back to the previous slide here, you've done the hard work. Well, the, the deal maker's done the hard work because without him in the center, the deal wouldn't be possible. It really is as simple as that. So in order for them to make the deal, to sell the deal on, it's got to be worth their while. Otherwise, why would they be doing it? And it really is as simple as that. Now going on, here's some of the fees that can be associated with some deals. So if, typically a small house, you can generate anywhere between a two and three thousand pound fee. Lease options, rent to rent, which is more of a specialist in a niche area, you can charge anywhere between two and ten grand. Then you've got the average property deal, which is around five grand, which could be like a BMV deal, which is below market value deal. And then you've got larger houses or smaller HMOs, could be anywhere between five and eight thousand. Then you've got larger HMOs or commercials that could be anything from 10k onwards. And then finally, uh, you've got plots of land, which is development plots, and could be anything up to anything up to thirty grand onwards. So I'm going to be talking to you briefly about some of the deals that we've done. So here's some of the deals that we've done so far. So in uh, Dudley, which is in the West Midlands, and the one thing that I am going to do is, again, I think we're live on Facebook, so hi to those that are joining us. But on Facebook, we've uh, sorry, I, in Dudley, we've got a ready-made uh, six-bed HMO, which we're direct to the owner with. The market value of it was actually 125000 We negotiated with the vendor. A purchase price of 110,000, which meant that we've got a discount of 15,000 pounds. As a result of that, we were able to get a sources fee for 5,000 pounds, and it took a time to get the fee of three days. So that three days was simple. It was literally going to the vendor, negotiating the deal, coming back and selling the deal in generating a fee for £5,000. And it only took three days to get paid. Now, any stage, have I sent over any money or have I done anything to put money into the deal? Because a deal sourcer doesn't do that. A deal sourcer creates a deal. A deal sourcer is simply generating the lead, negotiating the deal and selling the deal. It's pretty much like being in a shop. Now, just imagine that you own a shop and it's a double-edged sword. For people to come into your shop, well, first things, two things. You've got to have a shop and you've got to know that there's a client base because in your shop, you've got to have the goods for people to come to it. But more importantly, they've got, you've got to, so you've, in your shop, you've got to have the goods and then you've got to have the customers. And you, as a deal sourcer, have, has got to control both that. You've got to have deals, and you've also got to have people wanting to buy the deals off you. Does that make sense? Okay, so first question come in. So uh, Johnny said, how did, you do, uh, how did you negotiate with the vendor to sell the property at 15 grand discount? Now, believe it or not, on a £125,000 purchase price, getting a 15 grand discount actually isn't that hard. Because 15 grand is just over 10%. Now you could walk into any estate agent tomorrow and negotiate a 10% discount, which technically speaking, any Tom, Dick and Harry can do. 
other things that we've got to take into consideration here is that it was a ready-made HMO. It was also a cash-generating machine. Uh, Sarah has asked a question, so how do you get paid on reserving the deal and not the completion? Now, the one thing that you want to do is that as soon as you've put A and C together, A being the vendor and C being the, um, the purchaser, you want to step out the center because your job has been done. So you get paid as soon as you've introduced the purchaser. And the purchaser is the one that purchases uh, is the one that pays your fee because you've introduced them to a deal that they may not have seen this. Um, so just going through a couple of questions here. So, but surely the deal sourcer needs to be credible. Can't be someone off the street, right? Okay. So, what does it take to become a credible sourcer? Your deal has got a stack. That's pretty much a key point because if your deals don't stack, guess what? No one's going to buy it. The more deals that you do, the more credible you become. And you've got to be out in the field. You've got to be hungry. And we're going to be talking about some of the traits that you're going to require. Second deal that we're going to be talking about, and if you are on Facebook, in actual fact, you can actually join our webinar. You can see the slides just by clicking the link on one of the uh, profile pages. So second deal that we're talking about is a property which is a mixed commercial deal, a uh, commercial residential deal that I've done in Devon and is due to complete, I'm hoping, this week. So again, we're direct to the owner. Uh, market value of it was £140,000 and negotiated it down to 115 pounds gave us again a £25,000 discount. And because of the deal and the way that we structured the deal, we were able to get a sources fee of £10,000. And this one took a little bit longer because the purchasers wanted to actually exchange and they wanted to pay us on exchange, which isn't an issue, but we need to know uh, beforehand before we proceed. So we took half up front and we took the other half on exchange. So we have exchanged. Okay, so uh, just going through again some of the questions. Um, so Sarah's put, so I have a deal which I've just put together. I will make sure it gets over the line because I feel a duty of care to the vendor, a distress, a distress sale. Would you not do this? Of course you would because obviously you've got two things here. You're, you've got a duty of care to the vendor because you're, you were the initial point of contact to them. And then you've also got a duty of care to the purchaser because they've come to you on the basis that they're buying a sound investment opportunity off you as a sourcer. Does that make sense? So yes, you will see it over the line, but once they're, technically speaking, once they're in legals with one another and the mortgage surveys happened, if they're getting a mortgage, what else is it that you can do? There may be a few questions that you may need to bounce back and forth, but surely that's not going to take a lot of time. So yes, still see it through to the center. But yes, I take the fee up front. And the reason why I take the fee up front with Sarah is very simple. I want to make sure that we've not got tire kickers walking around. And if they've got some skin in the game from day one, guess what? They're committed. And that's the honest answer. So going on now, uh, those are, that are on my email database, you will see uh, that a lot of the deals that I'm talking about tonight have all been pushed through our email database. So you will you would have seen them. So the third deal is one in Birmingham, which is a rent-to-rent -rent opportunity. This one was actually bought to me by a letting agent, and it, we agreed a seven-year term on a rent-to-rent -rent agreement where the cash flow would exceed well in excess of a thousand pounds a month, and we took a sources fee of ten grand on that, and it took one day to get our fee because the deal was that good. We sold it many times over. Finally, uh, sorry, we've got some more. We've got Bolton, another direct to vendor deal. Put a market value was one hundred and forty thousand. We agreed with the vendor one hundred twenty thousand. We took a three k fee. And it took seven days for us to get our money on there because it took us a, a little bit longer to sell that deal. We've got a seven-bed ready-made HMO in Telford, which again was direct to vendor, and we negotiated. Per, per, sorry, the market value was one hundred forty thousand. We negotiated the price down to one hundred twenty-five. We took a six k fee, and it took two days for us to get the deal, uh, get the deal over the line. 
and other deals that we've got going, going through. Burnley, we've got 26 bed HMO going through. In Middlesbrough, we've got three bed semi going through. In Wigan, we've got three bed semis going through. In Hampshire, we've got three bed Masonette going through. I'm just trying to think of other deals. Now, one thing just bear in mind is that, and some of the deals that we've just talked about, that's generated well in excess of £56,000 in sources fee just from these deals alone. And you've got to remember that we're barely just at the end of April. April, we're four months in. We're a third of the way through. Now, ask yourself the question. When we talked about our why, why do we do this? What would we do with this additional income? Would £56,000 for four months work suffice your requirement or would you need more? Going back to the question is, what what's the figure that you need to survive on a year? Now, working on the basis that each deal is going to produce you on average between two and 3000 as the absolute minimum, how many deals do you need to do a year to survive? Now, for argument's sake, when we talk about this analogy, we always talk about the HMO. For HMOs producing a thousand pounds a month, how many HMOs you need to meet your monthly outgoing? So, some people say, "Well, I'd like a fifty k. I'd like fifty k a year." So, but we've done that in four months. So, you know, technically, well, we've covered your outgoing there. Now, just a, a little secret is that in 2015, I actually did 140 deals alone. And we decided that we're going to double that target for 2015. And I'm going to give you an opportunity now as to show you how we can do this. Uh, David, who's online. Uh, hi, David. Hope you're well. Hope you're enjoying it. Um, so keep moving on. Now, we're going to be talking about how can we do these deals? Where do we find them? How do we find the owners? Now, a couple of things. I'm going to give you away, uh, give away a few key secrets here. First one is how do we find them? First one that I always use is trade uh, is by tradespeople. Have you never thought that some of the tradespeople, like electricians, plumbers, architects, um, you name it, they all go out to these properties. Uh, what do they do? They always get to know the vendor. And providing that you say, well, in actual fact, every time you go out to a property, if you bring me the deal, if you bring me the lead, if I end up buying the deal, I'll give you a sum of money. Now, my electrician bought me a deal a couple of weeks back. Um, and he says, Arsh, and this was a rent-to-rent -rent deal. He goes, out, I've done, just done this work on this block of flats, nine flats in Wensbury. Uh, and he goes, out, the, uh, the owner doesn't really want to manage him. He goes, will you manage him? I'll go, I'll do one better than that. I'll let them all off him for the next seven years. And we're in the process of negotiating a seven-year rent-to-rent deal. Now, as a result of him bringing me that deal, providing the deal gets done, he's going to get 500 quid. Now, from a point of view of the electrician, do you think he's going to be happy with that? How many days would he have to work to generate 500 pounds normally? On average, about four, between four and five. I've just handed him 500 quid within the space of 10 minutes. Now, these people, remember, the one thing I wouldn't suggest is that you, you don't literally just go to all your electricians and go, da, 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 or just pick up the yellow page and do this, because it takes time to build rapport. But you need to be speaking to the people that you work with every day. And believe it or not, if they know that you're in the market to source deals, depending on what it is, they can help you. Now, there's other strategies that we will be talking about. I'm conscious of the fact that we were meant to start at uh, 8 o'clock, but we ran very late. Next one is direct mail. Now, how many properties are there on the open market? How many people can you write to? I appreciate writing out to people. Maybe timely. It might be time-consuming. Now, there's so many other ways that we can locate owners. Now, when we say we're talking direct mail, we're talking about going on land registry, finding out who owns the property, writing to them in their writing to them at their residential address and not or the residential or the correspondence address and not the property for sale because generally speaking if it's a investment property the person who owns it won't be living there so keep moving on leaflets is a big one now there's this uh 
there's an actual strategy called guerrilla marketing, which is technically speaking all about ugly marketing. How do you get yourselves out there? People talk about putting Corex boards on. People talk about putting leaflets out. But it's a it's a massive strategy. It's a long term strategy. It's not a case of you've got to put out you're going to put out ten leaflets and you're going to get ten responses. You've got to put out pretty much twenty five thousand, a hundred thousand leaflets to get responses. It's a low response rate, but hopefully on the basis that your message is clear enough, you're going to get numbers. You're going to get calls, and I know this because I've been trading properties for over fifteen years. And in that time, we've put out hundreds of thousands of leaflets. And as a result, we've done a lot of business. How you put your leaflet out or what goes onto your leaflet is an art in itself because you've got to make sure it's catching. You've got to make sure that it doesn't end up with the rest of the takeaway menus. Because what you can find is that, believe it or not, Takeaway menus just end up at the bottom of a drawer and they never get looked at again. What leaves yours so striking that they're going to call you? So moving on. So for those that are on Facebook, I'm actually doing a, a presentation, which is, and you can actually see on my uh, on my profile page, a link to a webinar where you can actually see my screen and my slides as well. So, if you if you do want if you do want to know about what what's going on on screen, by all means, you're more than welcome to. So, one thing that I would suggest is that finding owners is an art in itself. So, finding the homeowner is an art. Now, back in the year two thousand, there were lots of people buying property, no money down. And when I looked in the back of my newspaper, I would always see about 40 or 50 people saying, yes, we will buy your property off you, seven days completion, cash purchase, da da da, da. Call Paul or call David and a mobile number or landline number. And I thought, well, what can I do to differentiate myself from all these people? So I went off and rented some um, high street offices in the heart of Wolverhampton. For those that have been on any of my workshops, you would have been to my work, uh, to my office in Wolverhampton. We call the company We Buy Properties Fast. And what do you think we did? We do exactly what you say on the tin. We buy properties fast. And so I went out on a massive marketing campaign. Now, I'm not suggesting that you all do this. It was expensive, but the rewards were well worth it. So um, when people were calling me, they said, Arsh, okay, uh, we've seen uh, that you've got an office. And I said, well, I'll tell you what I did. I've never really said this before, but when people call me and they said, well, we're going to go and try Dave, who's also advertising the back of paper. And I always used to say to them, is that, what happens if Dave disappears tomorrow? Do you know where he lives? They go, well, no, Ash, we don't. I said, well, we've only seen him in the back of the paper. I said, so what stops them turning their mobile phone off tomorrow? And where are you going to track them? Now, if they're halfway through a property transaction, where are you going to find them? And they go, oh, shit, yeah, that's a good point. So I said, well, with my company, I can't literally do that. I can't turn off my mobile phone because in actual fact, I've got high street offices in Wolverhampton. So why don't you come and see me at my office? We'll look at what the, uh, about the, we'll talk about the property. We'll figure out what the problem is and let's find a solution. We even started opening on Saturdays and Sundays, and we call them the weekend property clinic. And we had so many people come through our doors. Now, that's what set us aside from our competition. And when we started in marketing deals like that, when we started to market ourselves like that, we were purchasing up to 30 properties a month. Or should I say we were trading up to 30 properties a month. Now, I'm not all suggesting you go out tomorrow and get high street location, but I'm just giving you different ideas of different marketing tactics as to how you can do this. <clears throat> so moving on, who can do this? Now, for those that are online, including the guys that are on Facebook as well, do you think you can do this? Do you think you have the skills and the talent and the ability to become a deal sourcer? Has there been anything that I've said so far that has worried you and think, well, in actual fact, I'm not too sure about this? Because believe it or not, all the skills that you require 
are all the skills that you already possess. And we'll be talking about them shortly. So negotiating is a big skill. Sales and communication are key skills. But guess what, guys? You already possess these skills. And the reason why I say that is very simple. And for those that have got kids that are on Facebook, and for those that have got kids that are online, is that how many times do you have to negotiate with your children every day? I had to negotiate today. I had my two-year-old daughter with me in the car. And she was so insistent on wanting something. I said, well, I said, darling, unfortunately, you know, you can't have that. But how about we do it this way? It was a negotiation. Now, for those that know me, I love a good negotiation. And if you're good at negotiation, you will always get what you want. But the beauty and the ability is that you've got to have the ability to create a win-win-win scenario. And when I say three wins, it's simple. The vendor has to win. When we say the vendor, we're talking about the owner. They have to win. You have to win. Otherwise, what's the point? Why are you doing it? More importantly, the purchaser has to win. Because if it's not a deal, guess what? They're not going to buy it. So three people in the transaction, every single one of them, has to be satisfied. Now, I'm just going to tell you very briefly is that, yes, I am running a deal sourcing workshop. It's on the 14th and 15th of May 2016, and we're holding it at the Jury's Inn uh, Hotel in Birmingham, which is just on Broad Street. Uh, and because a lot of people have just actually said, well, you know, we talk about how do you know what discount to apply to the property and some of the questions that we're going to go through actually are answered on these days so over the two days there's a couple of things that we look at we look at the 10 most effective strategies that bring in deals we look at the abundance of sorting strategies and how to build your marketing plan we talk about how to write effective copy for your adverts so how to make your advert the best out there so that it catches your eye more importantly, we also give you all the templates of all our leaflets, all our adverts and everything that we've used, including all our documents. So our sales documents, our exclusivity documents, our NDA documents, our option agreements and much, much more. Now, for argument's sake, if you went to a solicitor and asked them to draw, draw these documents up, guess what? You're going to be spending thousands of pounds just on those documents alone. And the key is, remember I talked about the double-edged sword, about being the shopkeeper and being the person uh, and the customer? You in the centre has got to make sure that both parties are happy. Now, having all the deals but no one to sell to is kind of pointless. Having all these people wanting to buy and having nothing to sell is kind of pointless. So you've got to do it in tangent with one another. So we'll also be talking about how to create an investor database. I've got an investor database of over 50,000 investors. Every deal I acquire, I can pretty much guarantee, I would say 98, 99% of the time sell. In all the time, in 2015, I've only not sold one deal. I'm still pushing it. So on day two, we look about how to turn it into a business. Now, someone also asked previously about the legalities. Yes, there are some legalities that you need to know about becoming a deal sourcer. We talk about how to build up your presence in social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, building your team, the tradespeople. Why do we need those tradespeople? Who are the tradespeople? What do we say to them? Then we start talking about recruiting the right staff and the systemization. Now, normally, if you go on my website, you could normally have that for just over £2,000 plus VAT. But I'm not going to ask for any of that because um, I believe of in offering value, and we'll be talking about that shortly. Now, going back to the skill set, what are the skills required in deal sourcing? Now, I've put it down to four things. Hunger, focus, enthusiasm, and desire. Four key points. And when we look at those, focus, hunger, enthusiasm, and desire, because you've got to have the ability and the hunger to go out and want to do the deal. But most importantly, most of, most of all, you've got to have passion. But passion is stuff that you do in everyday life. Now, for argument's sake, let's just say that me and you, we've both gone to the same property. Uh, I'm just going to use, for argument's sake, Julian, who's online, um, 
uh, Julian and I both go to the same property. Julian walks in first. He walks around the property, and then I walk in uh, a couple of minutes after. What will determine and who does the deal is who has the most passion for the property. And more importantly, who can create the best win-win-win for the, for the investor and also the vendor. But if I portray that passion in such a way and the vendor laps it up, guess what? I'm the one that's going to be walking away with the deal. And it really is as simple as that. And when you're really passionate about something, I'm passionate about property because this is my full-time occupation. This is what I do every day for a living. I can pretty much guarantee that when I walk into a property because of my knowledge and my passion, I'm going to do the deal. Now, one of the key to deal sourcing is negotiation. To be successful in deal sourcing, You've got to be a strong negotiator. There's no other way of you know, even trying to sell that or describe that. You've got to be able to seal the deal. Go in there, know exactly what you're after, and do whatever you can to get the deal done. And therefore, the script is the key to success. Because going in there not knowing what to say, there are certain buzzwords that you've got to be able to activate. And when the vendor falls in love with you, guess what? doesn't matter whether the house is worth a pound or a million pounds. You're going to do the deal with them. The script is an important part. Going in there saying that their property is okay and walking around half, you know, half interested isn't going to do the deal. You know what? This is a fantastic property. I'd love to be able to help you. What is it that we can do? How can we work together? That's a key. And now here's here's the important part because people think that just going walking in and doing a deal is one thing, but guess what, guys? If you screw up the numbers, the deal is worthless because the devil is in the detail. You've got to figure out what is the break-even point. What is it that's going to? What's the market value? What have you negotiated it for? How realistic are the figures? And can you sell the deal? Because if you can't sell it. What are you going to do with it otherwise? Has it been a pointless has it been a pointless exercise all round? More importantly, you've got to show your vendors that you can actually deliver. So when you go out to meet the vendors, they've got confidence in you and you've got the confidence in yourself that you can actually deliver everything that you've just said. Now just so that I know that I haven't bored you completely to death, because I appreciate there's, uh, we've run slightly over on time. Do you mind if I ask, and this includes you guys on Facebook as well, is that where, where do deals exist? Now, working on the basis that now the government putting all this intervention in, in that uh, you're going to have to put new stamp duty rules if you're into HMOs, there's Article 4. Now, for argument's sake, where else can we find deals where we can buy and sell property? Do they only happen in poor places up north or do they happen pretty much nationwide? I'm hoping that by the presentation that you've seen earlier today, Okay, so here's a great question actually. Ollie's jumped just jumped straight in and he goes, "Are you honest with the vendor entirely and explain that you're selling the deal on?" Ollie, it's a phenomenal question. Um, Ollie, and the honest answer is that whenever I'm sourcing a deal on for another investor, I always make it clear to the vendor from day one that it will not be me personally buying the property. I will say it will be one of my associates or one of my business partners. So the contract may be in a business partner's name, but never fear because I will see the transaction right through to the end. You've got to remember one thing is that the vendor is after one thing. The vendor is after the sale of their property. How they get to that sale is irrelevant. Whoever buys that property is irrelevant as long as the vendor gets the deal signed, sealed, and de delivered. And this is where you come in. Because you've got to make sure that if you've told the vendor that the deal is going to happen in 28 days, it's going to be a cash purchase or it's going to be a mortgage purchase or there's going to be a surveyor going around the property, you've got to make sure that happens. 
Because if you don't make that happen, guess what? You've just lost credibility completely. And Sarah has hit the nail on the head. Deals exist everywhere. So Sarah's also coming in and goes, she goes, well, what DD, what DD do you do on the buyer? Well, DD stands for due diligence, for those that don't know. And there are a few things that we do do. We need to make sure that they've got proof of funds. We need to make sure that if they are getting a mortgage, they've got like a decision in principle. There's loads of things. I've got a step-by-step -step guide of all the things that we ask of purchasers if they're to do a deal. Now, um, moving on. I'd like to ask you a question, and this includes you guys at home as well, is that how would you like to align yourself with me? I would welcome the opportunity to work with you and give you the opportunity to work with us, and here's how. Now, like I said, I am running a workshop on the 14th and 15th of May. It is based in Birmingham of the West Midlands, and we're doing an advanced deal sourcing strategy workshop. It's Saturday and Sunday. And we'll be looking at a couple of things. How to find deals. How to market to find deals. How to understand what to say to the vendors. How to build it so that it's going to be into a business. How to find purchasers. How to screen your purchasers. All the leaflets and the adverts and the media templates that we've got. As well as the templates for the contracts and the documents that we provide you from day one we'll be showing you also how to work with estate agents and have them call you seriously with deals because believe it or not estate agents and estate agents and letting agents are the two of the most easiest people to get on board because guess what guys what estate agents call business they're there to sell property now, if you said to them, guys, okay, um, and believe it or not, I could walk into Connells, could walk in Dixon's, Halifax, Reed's Range, you name it, any of the large corporates, as well as all the privates, and can say, okay, you've got this property here. Uh, now, I may not be purchasing it, but I know someone that will want to be purchasing it. I will be charging them a fee, and you will make your fee off the vendor. How does that sound? Guess what? They're not having to market the property. They're not, they're not spending money on the property, and they'll do the deal with you. And I just don't understand why so many more people aren't doing this. I'm not saying that you have to put, I'm not saying that you have to put tens of thousands of leaflets out. I'm not saying that you have to go around and stick something on a lamppost. I'm not saying that you have to make it hard work. This can be done at the moment if you're in full-time employment on a part-time basis. Once it's sort of a scale, you can leave your job and you can actually make this your full-time business. On the Sunday, we also have some very good friends of ours, uh, tax uh, planning specialists who will come in and talk about once you're making money, how to keep it in your pocket and not having to pay it all out in tax. We'll be looking at how to set this up as a business, how to create the virtual office and how to create the, vir the virtual landline so that when people call you, it's not just, hi, this is Dave. This is, hi, this is We Buy Properties Fast. Arshalah, he's speaking. How can I help? portray yourself to be a lot bigger than you actually are at that time because no one wants to deal with a one-man band because a one-man band can disappear tomorrow so like i said it's on the 14th and 15th of may 2016 here's some of the last courses that we ran as you can see that we've we had quite a number of people on it and the person on the left hand side here he came and trained in Feb 2015 and as a result of that he's actually done well in excess of 23 rent to rent deals which he has sourced by using the same strategies that we've shown on this so you can see some of the pictures that we've got and what we'll be doing is be getting you to become a lead magnet so that you can effortlessly, uh, effortlessly pulling deals and leads every month by using low-cost techniques. I'll be showing you how to build long-lasting relationships, not only with investors, but also state agents, so that they become repeat customers for your deals and properties. More importantly, here's a key. I'll be showing you a secret of a credit card-sized advert that made the phone ring for months. 
it only costs £57 to implement and it will put you in contact with enough cash investors to sell, to sell houses and deals on for the rest of the year. And the key to it is that I'll be giving you all my documents and all the skills required for you to go out and do this the very much day, very next day. And here it is. You can have it, instead of paying £2,000 for it, you can have it for 995 for the whole weekend. So that's £995 for the whole weekend. It's on the 14th and 15th of June. And for anyone that comes on the workshop, I'm going to allow you to JV with us. So for argument's sake, if you haven't created your database yet of investors, if you find a deal, I'm going to allow you to bring it to me and I'll do the deal for you. I'll sell it through to our investor database. All you've got to do is source the deal. So if you like the thought of that, and I'm so confident that this will work, and this has worked for hundreds of people, for the people that we've trained throughout the years, is that I'm going to give you a money-back guarantee. At the end of day one, if you're not completely satisfied, all you've got to do is send me an email or just have, come and have a chat with me, and I'll give you a complete refund there and then. No hassles or forms to be filled in. All I ask is that you attend and fully participate on the on the workshop so that you have all the tools that you need to succeed. It really is as simple as that. Because when we talked about it earlier, there's no better time than now to get involved in deal sourcing. The government is making it harder for us to become investors for to hold long time long term stock. It's a time now to shift our strategies. There are still people out there buying. But more importantly, like I said, if your cash flow of a property is approximately two to two and a half to three thousand pounds a year from a single let, you can make that from one property just by trading it. Why would you want to own it? Why would you want to deal with tenants? Why would you want to deal with letting agents? Why would you want to deal with you know all the other all the the maintenance, the issues that come along with it? So like I said, it's 995 and what you can do is that if you are interested in it, you can actually go straight onto my website which is arshilahi.com and then forward slash and it's DP which stands for Deal Packaging MC which stands for Masterclass. So arshilahi.com forward slash DPMC and you can have a look at all the stuff that we'll be covering on that weekend right there. And all you have to do is either copy that link into your browser because what I want to do is get you to become an exceptional individual in deal sourcing and turn you into a deal sourcing specialist. What you do from here on is completely down to you. So what you'll get on the day is a deal sourcing training day, a business, uh, a business building training day, all the sourcing contracts, all the legal documents and the template letters and the adverts You'll be getting the, the meal on the day. You'll be getting the membership to the support and the secret group. It doesn't just end on the day. You'll be having access to both myself and Neil Ward, who will be presenting the workshops. And you'll be, be, you'll be adding into a, a private Facebook group where you can continuously keep asking us so the support is ongoing. You get a one-on-one -on -one call with Neil after the workshop and you get the lifetime support through the social media forums. So I hope that helps. Again, it is on the 14th and 15th of May. It's at the Jewelry's Inn at Broad Street in Birmingham. And on the Saturday evening, there could also be a social as well. So if you decide, we can all go out for some drinks thereafter. So it doesn't always have to be about business. Now, here's one. If you book tonight, I'm going to allow you to bring a business partner for free. Yep, that's right. Two for the price of one. But that offer expires at midnight tonight. Now, Ollie's come in and says, Arsh, I'm on a family holiday that weekend. Are you recording it and selling the recording? For those that book on tonight, yes, we will be recording it. And I will send it. I, I can send you the recording. Other option is, is that if you can't make it in person, there's one thing that we do do is something called a live streaming version. So like the guys on Facebook are watching me right now, you can be watching us in the workshop on the weekend from the comfort of your own home. You get all the documents emailed to you 
prior to the event and you don't actually have to leave your own house. Naturally, it's better for you to come and network with us. Naturally, it's better for you to come and mingle in the group. Naturally, it's better for you to come and meet us in person. But there's, you know, if you can't make it for whatever reason, if you can't get childcare, there is the live stream version. We've only got 12 seats available for the weekend, which means, technically speaking, if there's six couples, we've only got six available places. And in addition to that, we're actually going to throw in all our marketing mind maps. So me and Neil have both created something, and we've systemized it to a T, so that we've got lots of marketing mind maps. So how do who creates the so for argument's sake, if we're creating an if we're creating a advert. Who creates the advert? What goes on it? Where does it go? What color? Uh, what color? What colors go on it? Where is it printed? Who distributes them? And this is systemized to a T, so that when you next come around to doing it, you don't have to retrain your mind to do it. You've got the mind map there for you. And again, the link is online, so it's arshilahi.com forward slash dpmc. And if you like the thought of all that, Neil is, like I say, currently in California. He'll be back later this week. You've got his Facebook details there, so you can find him at neil.ward3. Alternatively, you can actually come through to me direct. For those that are on my Facebook, you can actually um, get in contact with me via Facebook Messenger, or you can contact me on my mobile number. For the guys that are on webinar, you can actually see my mobile number there and then. I'm actually going to be uh, available for the next 20 minutes or so. But what I would like to do is take this opportunity to answer any questions, whether that be on Facebook, whether that be on here. So Sarah's come back and asked, do we have a later date? At the moment, Sarah, the one thing that we can say is that there may be one running in the tail end of July, if not the start of August. So the one thing that you could do, if it's of interest to you, you can book on for the special offer and then say that you want to request the next available course and I, we can do that for you. So that's not an issue. So just checking through some of the questions. So Nigel's asked, and it's a pretty straightforward question, how do you establish the market value? Now, Nigel, it's a great question. Um, well, market value is simple because technically speaking, uh, w one thing that you can do is get three estate agents out and they can determine the value. Now, let's say for argument's sake, the house was, they said the house was worth 110 grand. Now, one, you could get three agents out. One may value it at 100, one may value it at 110, one may value it at 120. What you've got to do is have a look at all the comparables what did all the other properties sell for in that location? And that's what you've got to work on your comparables on. Now, if all the others have only sold for circa around 97, is it really worth 120? Unless it's got something substantial like a massive, like a massive extension on the side, I don't think it would be. I would think it's closer to the 100 than it would be the 120. So a bit of common sense actually does come into play here. So someone's asked, does this work in London? Now, my answer to that is everything works in London. And the reason why we say that is because there's so many opportunities in London that people are just blind to the fact that just because it's a capital, they think that people, the deals can't be done in London. Now, in London, properties are a lot more expensive. But then saying that, in London, there's a lot more debt the cost of living is so much more expensive than it would be in, let's say, for argument, say the Midlands or the North. That means that there's extended an additional pressure on people living in London. So yes, it does work in London. More importantly, the demand for property in London is so high that you could sell deals 10 times over. Right, okay. Is there an average time of being set up enough Is there, sorry, is there an average time of being set, uh, set up enough to trade one's first deal? Ray, you could go out and do this tomorrow and on the basis of all the stuff that I'm going to be teaching you, you could go out and start looking for your first deal on the Monday thereafter. 
as with regards to time, you've got to remember, you can't determine the deals that, well, the deals that are going to come through. First thing that you've got to do is figure out, is it an actual deal? Then you've got to go through the negotiation. Then you've got to, sorry, you've got to go through the due diligence. Then you've got to go through the negotiation. So depending on from the point of contact to the point of negotiation, let's say that takes the best part of a couple of days to the best part of a week. And then the next thing is having to sell the deal. If you're to sell it to my database, let's call that another week. So technically speaking, there's two weeks. And then if someone buys it and then they go off and try and get a mortgage on it and complete, that could take another 28 days. So all in all, that whole transaction could take six weeks. But remember, you get paid the moment that you introduce someone to the property. So you get paid in week two, so to speak. So Anne's come in and asked a question. How can you be assured that the buyer will pay their fee and not go direct to the vendor after they've been given the details? Now, Anne, great question, because you get paid before you give the details. Your marketing has to be vague. But more importantly, actually, Anne, you should know this, because Anne's part of a group, uh, which we um, group called the Elite Property Tribe, and... The one thing that you should have from your vendor before you even start to try and put it out for sale is an exclusivity agreement, which gives you exclusivity to the, to the property so that no one could go back and try and sell the deal behind or go and knock on the door behind. So, raise put, do NDAs really hold water? Yes, they do, because why would large corporates not use them otherwise? You know, remember, you... When you're now when you've negotiated the deal, you need to make sure that you've got exclusivity to the property so that you don't have the door knockers that can go off and try and cut you out the deal. So, Sarah, how, how do you operate nationally? How do you do the deal without seeing the properties? Well, there's lots of things that you can do, Sarah, because for argument's sake, you technically may not have to go and see the properties. You may have other people in the location that can go and see the properties. Um, one thing that I would suggest is that, especially if you're starting out, is you do it locally in your location and work from there. Okay, so Harmesh has come in and says that I'm in communications with a property developer. He's signed a fee rate. However, I've never sold a property, so how could I effectively sell a deal of a property in excess of £2 million? Okay, interesting. Harmesh, unfortunately, I haven't got sufficient information on that deal for, for me to be able to say uh, whether first thing I want to do is figure out is it what's it worth? Is it worth well in excess of £2 million? What's the discount? What's the due diligence that you've done? Where's the deal come from? What exclusivity documents have you got signed, etc., etc.? So there's a fair bit that we need to do there. So uh, I'm just going through some of the other questions. So Alex has put, how far away are we from saturation in the HMO market? Do you think this will happen? Are you still investing in HMOs? Yeah, believe it or not, Alex, I am still investing in HMOs. I believe there is going to be a saturation point, but then saying that, um, it's, there's going to get to a point where it's going to become extremely, extremely tight for there's going to be over, ex, well, there's going to be excess in demand, uh, excess of properties or glut of properties because there are so many HMOs propping up. That's why I'm always looking for another strategy. My strategy now is that we're still sourcing. Like I said, we did 140 deals last year. This year, we're looking to double. We're, we're looking to double what we did last year. So 240 deals is what we're looking to... Uh, sorry, 280 deals is what we're looking to do in 2016. And we're on track for that. So just quickly going through... So a lot of people are asking questions about my vinyl, uh, about my vinyl collection, which I'm glad you appreciate. I've, I've been, well, I've been DJing professionally since the age of 15, so uh, just over 20 years, uh, and I've got quite a quite a large. Let's see if I can take it. Quite a large uh, vinyl collection, which is just part of it. A lot of it is all uh, tucked away in storage still and in plastic plastic containers. I've still got my vinyl uh, vinyl. Uh, 
vinyl decks there as well as my digital equipment so i'm glad you're appreciating that guys but okay so if there aren't any other questions i'm actually going to log off for the evening so i hope you've actually enjoyed the evening i hope you've taken something away from it um if there are any other questions you've got my mobile number which is just on there so for those that aren't on uh, that are on facebook my mobile number and you're more than welcome to take this down is 07967016425 i hope you've enjoyed the evening uh, i apologize for a few technical delays that we had at the start of the presentation uh, but we got there in the end and that's been by far one of the toughest parts of the presentation this evening. Deal sourcing can get you to financial freedom. There is no doubt about that. Remember, we've talked about some of the uh, some of the things that you require, and everyone is able to do it. Go out there, start doing it, and let's start working together. On that note, guys, I'm going to wish all the guys on the webinar a very lovely evening. You can come back. To through to me on my mobile and someone's asked for my mobile number again uh, thanks very much for your time and i'll be speaking to you all very soon take care good night god bless